Welcome back to Inside City Hall. We've got just a little more than a month left before the city budget must be finalized in advance of the fiscal year that starts on July 1st. And as the mayor's office negotiates with the city council, a number of items continue to pop up, including calls for additional police officers, funding for an ambitious capital construction program, and concerns about the overall fiscal health of our city. Queens Councilwoman Jalissa Ferreras plays a big part in those negotiations. She is chair of the city council finance committee, and she joins me now. Welcome back. Very good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. And uh, congratulations. I understand you just got married. Yes. Thank you very good. much. Good for you. Thanks. Um, let's talk some, some about the, um, the the overall finances of the city. We, we had the mayor basically talk about more money going into the budget, um, and but at the same time he said he needs to set aside some rainy day funds because we've had a pretty long economic expansion that won't be necessarily uh, permanent or long term. What's your sense of it? Are you as pessimistic in some ways as he is? Well, I think we have to be realists. Yes, the city's outpacing the national growth um, by about 3%. We've added 120,000 jobs. However, as the mayor had stated and um, through his director, Dean Fulahan, we have to be cautious. We cannot um, start spending everything, we do have to do some savings. But for us, from the council perspective, we think it should be established through a proper fund, which is the rainy day fund, as opposed to kind of stashing money in different the health savings agencies. accounts, yes. which is how the previous mayor used Right, it. and I think, you know, and I understand that we are limited in what we can do, but we should be able to go to Albany and say we need an appropriate rainy day fund so that as the council, we can follow those monies and for more true transparency, which has been my biggest issue with this process. Well, ex explain that a little bit. You'd be going to Albany for what, um, a home rule message so that you could create the rainy day fund? Exactly. We can't establish the fund um, as with our rules don't permit us to ha establish the fund on our own. Um, and hence why the mayor has decided to put monies in different places. Um, but the rainy day fund is something we can go up to Albany and ask for. And I think it's the most appropriate way for us to be able to store, because right now what we do is we prepay for next year, and that's part of our savings. So if we're prepaying, then we're able to take those dollars. And But in, on, on average, we've been rolling up to $3 billion. Yes. And even, even if you um, do set aside money through that rainy day fund or any other means, it, it has to be spent through uh, city administration, I mean, through city agencies anyhow, right? I mean, yeah. And we, we've seen in the case of, say, the NYCHA cameras, what happens when the administration is not really prepared for that. So how, how would you get around that with a rainy day fund? So I think the rainy day fund is really more about transparency, to be able to say this fund, we can grow this fund, this fund is um, focused on being able to prevent us having to cut services moving forward. However, when we have, um, for example, in the pay-as-you-go program, what, what I learned in the, in the capital hearing that we just had, or the hearing focused on capital expenses, there's a half a million dollars. And the way that it was presented to us was that this is going to help expedite the capital expenses and to make things faster. But then when you really delve into it, it's a place to park money. So in the event that the economy does have a downturn, uh -huh. we have enough money. Uh -huh. So how many more of those examples do we have? And as we go through the budget hearings, we're finding more and more of those examples. Interesting. So you'd be, you know, I'm fascinated by this, but <laughs> we, we've got other stuff to talk about. But we, so you would, you would want to do this, um, and what level of funding would you put into it? Well, you know, I think when we see that we're rolling over $3 billion, it's something that we have to analyze. Is it $3 billion? Is it $10 billion? Those are the things that we would need to negotiate mm -hmm. um, between the mayor and, and the city council. But allow us that opportunity to negotiate that okay. is, is what this council really wants us to do. W would that also be uh, sort of an ethics issue? I mean, I remember um, a previous speaker uh, parking money, and she wasn't the only previous speaker who had done that, and this would sort of uh, eliminate the need to do some of that. Well, I think it speaks to some of the concerns that we've had. This council in particular under Speaker Mark Viverito is all about transparency, and as the finance chair, I definitely want to make sure that everything is on the up and up. Sounds good. Um, I, I understand you have some concerns about the 10-year capital plan, um, although uh, it, it, and it's the biggest in the city's history, but, but my understanding is that this is critical to things like repairing NYCHA to things like uh, getting the affordable housing plan off the ground. What are your concerns? So my concerns aren't necessarily about how big the, pro the plan is. I think the fact that our mayor is thinking um, in a way that really strengthens New York City when we're talking about infrastructure improvement, when we're talking about NYCHA, when we're talking about the vision um, from now to 10 years from now. The issue that I have and that other members have is how we actually implement this plan. So it's great that we can talk about the vision of New York City, but how quickly can we spend these monies down? How quickly can we process this? So if OMB is taking their 
sweet time, you know, lack mm -hmm. of better. Um, but if OMB has their own system and then they go to the controller's office and then by the time it gets to DDC, why does it take my why does it take my discretionary dollars of a half a million dollars to put street lights on Roosevelt Avenue five years? Mm. Five years. Why does that take so long? So while it's an ambitious plan and one that the council very much agrees with, we must say and ensure that we have to figure out a way to expedite these projects, especially when it's the same projects over and over again. Well, if you, if you knew it was going to take five years, would you have allocated the money elsewhere or would you have said, well, let's just wait and then we'll just do it in five years or maybe even give the money back to the taxpayers until we're ready to spend it? Well, I think that that's the problem, right? That you take away the decision or the opportunity for council members to make that decision. So and that I, if, if I'm able to know that I can get laptops for a school in a year, perhaps that's the year that I do that. Um, or let me know that five years from now you're going to use my money, but to be able to take the capital money now and then you know, not, and then tell me next year, next year, it's in the process, we're designing, we're still, and I would think that street lamps are happening everywhere in New York City, so is there a process by which we can make this clearer and more expeditious? And I understand that projects will take different times for, for different projects, but if we're doing, a, a ba if we're building a bathroom in a park, a bathroom in a park is a bathroom in a park, yes. is a bathroom in a park, wherever you build it in New York City. Um, so why isn't there a way to streamline this process? I have visited many of those <laughs> on these council tours, including the one we did with you, and right, sometimes they take three, four, seven years. It's, it's, it's startling, actually. It takes longer than the term of a council member in some cases. Um, l let me ask you, though, um, about something that's going to really come up after this weekend. This is the unofficial start of summer. The beach is open and so forth. Um, thoughts start turning as we wind up the, the school year to summer youth employment. And um, Councilmember Eugene has been uh, quite vocal about the need to increase the number of, of summer jobs. Is that going to happen? Well, you know, it's a priority for us as a former Beacon director um, with Councilmember Jumani Williams as we talk about increasing police headcount. Um, we understand that we need to put the balance also in our young people. Um, for us, when we talk about last year, there was 47,000 jobs for summer youth employment. I was a summer youth employment, uh, so it works. Um, I would hope that there's more young people that are on their way to becoming council members and a whole host of other things. Um, but the reality is that I really believe that we need to have a year-round um, youth employment program because when we see our young people getting in trouble, like those horrible images that we watch in you know, McDonald's and whatever is happening in New York City, we need to be able to give them real opportunities. I think it's it's really really a lack of opportunities that our young people are screaming for. However, um, I understand that that is an investment, 18, about $18 million will help um, get 8,000 young people year-round employment. Summer youth employment was at 47,000. We want an increase in that also. But there's 130,000 young people that apply for those jobs. Wow. So we're saying no a lot more than we're saying yes. And that's not what this council nor this city should be about. We'll, we'll have a final number, of course, um, uh, by July 1st? Yes. Okay, we'll be watching for that as well. And um, I guess finally, when we have um, the, the, the budget being negotiated, the usual headline is the council wants 1,000 new comps. The mayor says that, yes, the city can afford it, but we don't want the 1,000 cops. Uh, that sounds in some ways like the old budget dance. I mean, I'm, I've been assuming all along, frankly, you guys are going to arrive at some number between 300 and 500, and that'll, that'll just be it. Uh, is, is that what's going on here? You know, those aren't the conversations that are, having, are happening now. We have a shortage of loss between 60 and 75 cops per precinct. Um, so those, when we say a thousand cops, we really calculated the need. And I know that the police commissioner, he testified in a hearing a couple of months ago saying that he needed a thousand cops. Now he's asking for less than that for counterterrorism. While that is very important, what that told me is maybe we need a thousand four hundred and seventy-five or whatever his number was. Mm -hmm. um, we're still very much focused on community policing. Um, we're not at that level of negotiating down. We're still asking for those additional but, but what, officers. What's, what's, what's the logic there? I mean, I've talked about this with several of your of, of your colleagues, including the speaker. Um, if 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 crime is down generally, I know we have a little couple of spikes here and there. Crime is down generally. Um, misdemeanor arrests are down dramatically. Marijuana arrests are down dramatically. Why more cops? Because the only thing that isn't down is overtime. So if we have an overtime problem, to me, it says 
that we need to get additional officers to cover this time. Um, when we have our officers still be taken to other assignments and pulled from our local precincts, then what are the domestic violence calls that aren't being made? What are, you know, what are, what are the issues that are not being addressed in the community while we're having those local officers pulled out? And, and, and it concerns, though, that hiring a new officer, while it might appear cheaper, at least in the short term, now we've got a 25-year obligation, pension and health for, for this person for, for a generation. Right? Well, I mean, if we look at the year to year, we have a $600 million obligation to overtime. Okay, fair enough. We shall see. Thank you for crunching some of the numbers with Thank us, you. and we'll see you as uh, down to City Hall as we get closer to the deadline. Thanks Great. a lot. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a short break now. Coming up next, Hillary Clinton breaks her nearly month-long silence with the media. I'll get opinions about that and more with two people who are rarely silent, Herson Barrero and Tom Doherty. The political rundown is coming up. Stay with us.